Welcome everyone to church. Congrats to our graduates and families. Welcome people joining us online. Um, our message today is uh, coming to us in this year-long journey. We've been walking through the Bible, uh, trying to connect the old scriptures uh, that God gave us so many years ago to our modern-day reality. And what we've done over the last now 38 weeks or so is started in Genesis, walking kind of you know, from the beginning uh, towards the end and connecting each of these kind of chapters uh, to what God is doing in the scripture. So we're in this section called Flame. We're looking at Colossians as Paul is going into the world being, uh, he's encountered Christ on the road to Damascus and now he's in Greece and uh, planting churches and then sending letters to these people and how to encourage them. And so the text today comes from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15. I'll read it, we'll pray, we'll dive in. Uh, Let the peace, uh, no, let me start at 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Will you pray with me now? Lord, thank you for our graduates. Thank you for our families. Thank you right now that there's a uh, hundred or so children in other parts of this building learning about your love and your grace. Um, it teach us at every season and every stage what your words mean to us. Give us lives that are impacted by the things that you've said before and you say again through the power of your spirit. We don't just want to be people who have heard about you once. We want to be people continuing to be formed into your image. So we can be commissioned, God, as a church and as people heading into all the world. In our daily lives, in our family systems, in our friendships, in our vocations, being people of hope. So God, now make this message come alive in us. Open our eyes and our ears and mostly our hearts to experience you again. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So this is our flame section. And our title of our message today from Colossians is called Words to Live By. Words to Live By. Thinking about the season of transition with our graduates, words to live by. In graduation season, into school year season, for some of us who don't have school-age kids, that maybe this doesn't feel like a big change in season with academics, but even what happened in the natural world over the last two weeks, it's like, oh, summer hit the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's a season changing. So what are words to live by in this new season? As summer leaving home, as summer reflecting, it's certainly time for some good last words. When uh, I was a uh, an athlete many years ago, we had a new coach in a season of success with a group of people uh, that had not been successful for about 10 years. And our coach came in before the biggest uh, game of our senior year and said, gentlemen, I mean, his voice was trembling. So you're like looking to the coach, like, give us, give us some words to live by, coach. And he's like, gentlemen, his voice cracked a little more than that. We're going to shoot for the moon. And even if we miss, we'll still be among the stars. To which one of my friends said, so if we miss, that means we lose though, right coach? Like this is like the pre-game speech. He's like, well, kind of, but we'll be in a good place. You know, and it just like went downhill from there where we just kind of shuffled on the field and promptly lost said game. Like that was the wrong words to live by. Shoot from the moon, if you miss, you'll be among stars. I don't know who said it, it's kind of a worthless saying. Uh, when I was a teacher and then I had the opportunity to give words to live by, I would uh, try to connect kids' story, uh, what they already knew to be true and their own identity with the purposes and needs of the world. And so one of my favorite was to teach about Henry David Thoreau, an American transcendentalist who in the early years of the movement were actually getting people to connect identity with connection to God. And oftentimes in my lecture teaching on American literature, I would, I would have this textbook, you know, those big textbooks in high school that you hated to carry around. And I would actually, because it would be like mid-lecture you know, mid by this point, so people would kind of roll their eyes back in the head, and I would just take it, I would throw it appropriately high in the air and let it land flat in the room. So it would just bang, about, you know, a third of the room would wake up at this point. And I would talk about Thoreau's wisdom. Henry David Thoreau moved to Walden Pond outside Concord, Massachusetts to live a life of purpose. He built a 10 by 15 cabin to live simply. And uh, he, inside his cabin, it was furnished with just a bed, a table, and a fireplace. And then he had 14 acres of farmland around to support himself. 
And though he had much solitude, he learned out there in the cabin his value of relationships as his words traveled. He said some incredible things, and he wrote incredible things about trusting thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. And that was normally the, the, the phrase that I would share with students after throwing said textbook on the ground. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Our voice is so important, our identity. And so Thoreau, as much as he's like out on Walden Pond, you know, living this life of individuality, out there on the pond, he also learned the value of human relationship. Um, Biographers who were studying his life noted that Thoreau had one table but three chairs. And he said the three, per- the three purposes of the chairs were very significant for him. One was for himself, always practicing solitude. For sure, the guy lived in a 10 by 15 cabin by the pond. But a second was a chair always set for friendship. So when people came from Concord, as they often would, he was ready for a conversation. And there was always a third chair, which for him was for society, when a crowd would gather. So Thoreau, this individualist and this writer, he had these simple words, but he learned to encourage others. Words for us as the people of God, as we segue into the text, are so important. People of the word, people of the living word who is Jesus Christ. And to live by words that carry purpose and meaning, that our life would be imbued with purpose, that we would live the words that Jesus said. The narrative of the scriptures, maybe sometimes in some generations, like, oh, it's full of colonialism or violence or empire, but that's just because we've seen people misuse the words of life that are existent in the text. But in today's message, as we open up Colossians and think more about what Paul meant when he was writing these words and think about Jesus, the very bread of life, we'll get the core of the message in the scriptures today. We'll get real words to live by about identity, about mission, about our purpose, certainly for those that are heading out and graduating, but for every age, for every stage, words of identity, words of mission, words of purpose, words to live by. The words shared in the letter to Colossians, to a people group in a city that no longer exists called Colossae, they became famous. This is one of Paul's shortest but most famous letters. He wrote this letter called Colossians to a group of people he never met, he would never know, and he would never visit. It's very unique. But last week we talked about uh, Thessalonians. Man, I, I, I spent time with you. I planted you. I loved you. Philippians, you know we shared life together. Colossians is really different. It was planted by a guy named Epaphras, Epap for short. It, Paul didn't even plant this church. We don't actually know the purpose of why he wrote Colossians. He was in jail in Rome, visited by Epaphras, probably who said, hey, can you give my friends in Colossae something to live by? They're having all this drama stirred up in their community. The, you know, the empire of Rome is knocking on the door. Nero is about to come to power. Like it's, very, it's very real. And so Paul writes these words to a group of people that he literally had no idea who they were but they're words to live by. He gave them his powerful words as a gift. And this church in Colossae, which was planted by Epaphras, was uh, planted during a season where Paul was actually in Ephesus. And what it says in Acts 19.10, that the word was so powerful as the church was growing around Ephesus, that for two years, all the Jews and Greeks who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. That even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. So the church in Colossae is 120 miles west of Ephesus, and and that's the setting of this letter, this little town in Colossae. These days, Colossae is an unexcavated high spot near the modern city of Hanaz in Turkey. It's an evaded archaeological excavation from historical tensions in the area and general academic disinterest in the area compared to other dig sites. But in its day... Colossae was bustling. It was a crossroads. It was a civic center. It was a very important church. And so this letter is the only letter with Philemon, which was written to the same group of people. The only two letters then were written to a church not planted by Paul. Maybe you could say Rome, those churches he didn't plant, but then he spent so much of his time in Rome. And we'll talk about Romans next week as we wrap this section up. But Paul's letter to Colossae are less formed by his relationships and more formed by the words of Jesus. 
And he's calling people to remember the words to live by. He's saying that these words can change a life. He'll say and plant uh, words of reconciliation in the midst of Colossae and peacemaking and identity and purpose and mission. Paul sends him this letter to say, hey, there is some words to live by. So remember your identity when problems arise. Remember that you'll be known by your actions and not just your thoughts, so consider carefully how you live. And remember too the Holy Spirit, the gift of Jesus Christ. Don't merely believe you're the sum of all your actions. You're more than that. You're, you're gold. So don't forget to excavate that which God has put inside of you. Your life has incredible purpose. Your fellowship with other believers in the church can change the world. Remember the kingdom, Paul's saying, is always about the center, not the margins. So focus on the major. Be full of what matters most. See, Paul has given us these words to live by. He's given us words to live by so that we as a church all these years later would live by these words. So let's dive into some of Paul's teaching in Colossae. And I think you'll find there's one or two of these points that will be important important for you, salient for your journey today, whether you're leaving high school, whether you're heading into any point of your journey this season ahead. First off here in your outline, created by him, don't forget who you are and whose you are. This is a line that we say often around here, but it bears repeating. Don't forget who you are and whose you are. Really, these are the two pieces that I'd love to encourage you around identity, both who you are and whose you are. Today's reading started, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. It's a good starting point to our message if we're considering both who and whose we are. So Paul's saying, remember, remember who you are. Like, start here. Uh, you are holy and you are dearly loved. What does it mean to be God's chosen people who are holy and dearly loved? He explains. First, you're a chosen people. You're chosen people. He's writing this again Remember, to a church, he doesn't even know. He's received secondhand knowledge. So you can't use that card of like, oh, he spent all this year, all this time. We know our best relationships are the ones that we spend the most time with. Paul's like, no, this is different. No, you're, you're chosen people. You're chosen. Like uh, we played kickball with, uh, with a bunch of fifth graders at Seaview Park last night. And you want to be picked for the team, right? At every age and every season. You're like, all right, we got two people Let's pick first. I got, I got you. You know, I got you. And you're just, if you're in that line, what are you thinking? Let me not be last, right? We've all had that experience. Please, Lord, help me not be last. Paul's like, no, here's the thing. In Christ, you're all chosen. Second, you're holy. You're, you're holy people. It's a word we do not use anymore. Uh, but when Paul's using this, he's like, Take care of that which God has established in you. Take care of your temple. Don't degrade that which God has made for himself. God is great. And holy places in the scripture, where there's anywhere in the world where God showed up and God would make a place holy. So in the Old Testament, it's like that, you know, at Bethel, that, you know, Abraham's walking. And it's like, man, when God shows up, what would they say? This place is marked with the presence of God. Let the generations remember holiness happened here. And in the New Testament people, Paul's like, you are all holy. You're all built to encounter God. So don't forget that. That you are in your very identity. You are a holy place. You were made to know and connect with God. So care for yourself in that regard. And then third, you are dearly loved. You're holy and dearly loved. We'd love to show you what this dearly loved, in English it's a couple of words, but in Greek it's a single word, epinai which means simply here, and we have this slide behind you because it's just cool to see the way it's written. It is beloved deeply, truly, fully. So when Paul says you are that kind of person, you are deeply, truly, fully loved. Now, have you ever been loved like that? Like sometimes our human love is is kind of, we're cognizant by as much as it lacks is what it's full of. But when God loves us, it's so fully deeply, truly, we, it's like we don't even have a handle for it. Paul's like, that's what you've been chosen. That's what you are a holy place to be uh, connected to God. That's the deeply loved nature of your identity. So the simple message of the gospel, Paul's reminding us that you, these words remind us your value is immeasurable because God has made you for himself. You are, every one of us in this room, a treasured possession. And where the church would take this message and sometimes 
pull away from people to kind of segue itself off, Paul's reminding us, like, the love of God connects us to each other in really powerful ways. In verse 11 of Colossians, Paul would say, there's no Gentile Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. Christ is all and is in all. So because of who he is, he calls us to be shalom bringers, peace makers. The text says, he is, in Colossians 1, the image of the invisible God, Jesus is, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or power, all things have been created through him, all things have been made for him, he himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Look at that last line, in him all things hold together. We can be so thankful that our life is more than just our efforts, because we're found in him, he holds all things together. And what Paul is writing to these people is both this calling of their holiness and their dearly belovedness, and he's going to call them to activity here in a moment. But he said, you know, words to live by first, don't forget. If you're taking notes here, the first thing just, you know, it's very simple, but it bears repeating. Our words to live by, number one, don't forget. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget whose you are. And remember, this is Paul. When you don't forget, you, you live different because your worth is more than just what society puts on you, more than your social feed, more than your degree, more than your net worth, more than your worries, more than your fears. Jesus is more than in a world that's often telling us that we're not enough. Jesus is more than enough. It's more than enough. So may we never forget. I don't know if you, if you saw the news this week, it was the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, uh, invasion off the coast of France, where Allied forces banded together on June 6, 1944 to defeat the tyranny of evil that was Nazi Germany. I've shared it before in this space, but uh, we'll tell you a little bit of my own personal story. That what they're saying with D-Day, the commemoration, is most of the veterans will be gone here in the next couple of years because they're at the far edge of their life expectancy. And those stories that bear repeating so that people don't forget. For my own grandfather, who is in the 82nd Airborne, he paratrooped in on D-Day in, uh, to the little town of St. Maria Gleese. This is a 30-mile inland town from Omaha Beach, and the 82nd Airborne including my grandfather, had, had dropped in behind enemy lines to support the beach invasions. One of his friends actually got stuck on the church bell tower as Nazis shot him through his foot, and he lived by playing dead. What happened there on D-Day was a time of incredible bravery and sustained hospitality, actually, by the French people working uh, against the Nazis. A few weeks ago, with uh, knowing the D-Day was coming up, some of the World War II history, which so many of us find so interesting. A few weeks ago, Avery and I were driving cross-country from Ohio, and we stopped in Grand Teton National Park. And we did a hike one day around a little lake, and we met two hikers who were from France. I said, oh, I was able to take my kids there, told them a little bit of our story, told them about my grandfather, St. Marie Glisse. And the first thing she said to me, very broken English, my French is impossibly bad. I'm not even going to try. But when I told a little bit of the story, what they could receive, the first words out of her mouth were, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what your family did to support and free our people. Because when somebody has come for you and fought for you and redeemed you, the reality is you, you never forget that. And kind of zooming back from D-Day now to put ourselves back in the context of people that have been saved by a loving God. Paul is saying to you, like, don't forget. Don't let go of a sense of gratitude that Christ came for you. He formed you. You are holy. You are beloved. Start there. Second, goodness on the outside. A little prompt here. Put it on. Paul's telling these people he doesn't really know and hasn't met. He's sending them words to live by. He's giving them encouragement. He's like, hey, the goodness that you'll need to live life as a believer, put it on. Put it on. I'll read you now from Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and loved, clothe yourselves with these things. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Like, put it on. Put on forgiveness. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, he says it again, put on love. Clothe yourself in love. Let it wrap itself around you, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Clothe yourself. Very interesting. 
It's, it's interesting as a metaphor, but it's actually just the exegetical work here. Paul's like, no, I literally want you as a people of God, I want you to put on that which you want to become. I want you to wrap yourself in the very character traits in Christ that are available to you, but maybe you don't feel like yet. Make choices to dress yourselves in the ways of godliness. Now we're in a season of uh, all things being senior. So a couple of weeks ago in, in our high school, but at every high school in the area is senior prom. I asked one dad of one of our friends who has a young woman, a senior who was at prom, I said, how, you know, how was it finding the dress? He said, we had 15 dresses in our house at one point because now we order them, take them back, take them. It's like what we put on is quite complicated in our house. He was laughing. I thought it was hilarious. And, you know, no matter people that maybe you went to the dance, didn't go to the dance, whatever, like put on that which you want to not just look like. We're talking more than skin deep. Paul is saying your character formation can, can be like the clothes that you put on this morning. So put on compassion. Put it on. P- put on kindness. Put it on. Humility, gentleness, patience. You might say, I, I don't have those things. I'm not naturally patient. I'm not naturally gentle. I'm not naturally compassionate. Paul's like, exactly. Like in Christ, clothe yourself in the very way in which you want your insides to be formed. It's, it's kind of a, an odd way to describe the life of sanctification. But he says it twice here, so we need to pay attention. The people that you want to become, Paul says, like put it on even as you're becoming it. You don't just become kind. You don't just happen upon compassion. You don't automatically inherit humility. You don't just wake up one day and say, I will always be gentle. No, Paul says the way to becoming more like God, which is the sanctification journey, it's the road we walk to become more like God. This journey to becoming all that God has made for you is a conscious decision to make, like the clothing that we spend so much time thinking about. So even while you're waiting to become more of who God has made you, Paul said, put on godly behaviors. Remember, he's never met them, doesn't know them, he's not judging them. He says in another place a letter, I know you're living a good and godly life, but continue then to make choices of changing into how God wants to transform you. Goodness on the outside, put it on. Your actions matter. Don't wait for your feelings to change. Well, maybe I'll wait to be less angry down the road. I'll wait to be less lustful. I'll wait to be less greedy. Like those days never come because the flesh is always counteracting the work of the spirit within. The world and its empire forces are trying to make less of God in our lives. So Paul's saying counteract those things. Like put on godliness. And, and oh, even more so, he's like, you know, even while you're waiting to feel different, worship, sing, teach, serve, and he'll say later in the book, make love your aim and clothe yourself with the new life because you have died, you're hidden with Christ. He'll go on in Colossians and he'll say, put to death therefore whatever belongs to that earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, but now you must rid yourself of anger, rage, malice, filthy language. Don't lie to each other. You've taken off your old self and you put on the new self. Don't just believe in God. Become more godly. Don't just think like, oh yeah, no, I I wish that I was less da-da-da-da-da. Paul's like, you have the very tools of Christ for your own sanctification. So allow Christ to change you and put those things on of Christ even while you are waiting to become all that God has for you. He'll say in Colossians 3, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. The second words to live by from Paul's letter I think are very apropos for us. He says aim high, like aim high with our lives aspire for greatness in our lives. Uh, Not just in our degree or in our net worth. No, the things that really matter. The kind of people we're becoming. The kind of love that we're cultivating. The kind of service that we offer the world. Forgive each other powerfully. And so he he does this over and over again in, in the text. And at the end of Colossians, if you read this week, he's got specific words 
to families living in Colossae and, and people that are slaves and slave owners. And they're, they're kind of hard for us to understand 2,000 years ago. But what scholars say at the end of Colossians is he's actually rewriting the family codes. He says the kind of families that we want to create are people who are aiming high, who are loving with our lives, who are serving each other. Paul would write to Philemon, who is the pastor of this little house church, and he says, I'm sending a slave back with the letter of Philemon, but don't consider him even a freed slave. Consider him in Christ a brother. Like when people try to tell you that the scriptures were just complicit with some of the slavery and some of the rage that we've seen you know, given to us by the world in the last 2,000 years, they're not reading deep enough. Because in Colossae, this rewriting of the code, and then the second letter, Philemon, which we've taught about before, and as a church, there's this really just mind-bending, altering, like set the slaves free by the power of Christ. So aim high for a life of love. Be known for what you're for, not just against. Live a life powerfully connected to the gospel story. And be part of changing the world. We need people. Every one of us in every stage. It's not just a word to the 18-year-olds. It's every one of us in our every stage. May we believe that our lives still matter. By living a life of love and loving people better and well, working towards our own health, working towards more of God in the world, that we become kingdom bringers, that we're putting on the very nature of the kingdom that we want to see released around us. So put on a life like that. Uh, To illustrate a life aiming for godliness, I want to tell you the story that I encountered recently of a young man named Jesus Morales. He's a 27-year-old internet star. I was surprised to know, I was talking about it this morning with Julie, so I know this guy. He's a TikToker, so maybe a lot of you have heard of him. I hadn't. Don't spend a lot of time on TikTok. No judgment. Uh, But Jesus Morales was trying to make a name for himself in the world, like a lot of us are. Self-promotion, strength training, all this and that. And even as a young man, his life changed when he started to focus on others instead of himself. He started making videos of giving money to day laborers and people in the bottom uh, living class in Southern California. He started making videos of giving money to people and then uh, taking day laborers to Disneyland. Now, some of these people, had, they were construction workers, and he would pull into Home Depot or places where day laborers would reside, and he would say, hey, I want to pay you for your, for your effort, and then he would take them to Disneyland. Some of these guys had literally been part of building and working in the park without ever having taken part in any of the rides. So he you know, has a video of these guys in you know, their construction orange, getting a full day's wages to do nothing more than just enjoy the magic kingdom. What Morales said is, what always the most surprising is their laughter. Hearing grown men and women who have been grinded down by the weight of the world with joy. He says, for me, what's most surprising is how powerful the internet is and how awesome it can be when you utilize it for good. In one of his more recent videos, he literally came to food cart workers who were on the edge of Disneyland, and Morales paid them for all of their goods, and so they again gave all of their food away, and then paid them for a day's wages, and then paid for all of their expenses inside Disneyland, all of their first time in the park. Now, this is not a commercial, take your family to Disneyland, you'll never forget it. It's not about it. It is a word about the real kingdom, though. And what a powerful metaphor that these laborers were working either outside the park or inside the park, but never had the joy and the expense, let's be honest, it's really expensive to to take people to Disneyland. They'd never experienced the joy that the park was created for. And I thought about that in some ways in our Christian life. For some of us, we're set up right on the boundaries Or maybe we've been working in the mission of the kingdom, working in service of the kingdom, of the king, but all the joy is gone. We haven't had the freedom of just laughter, the abandon of worship. We haven't been unshackled from our fatigue 
and anxiety and fear. Maybe Jesus this morning wants to pay you for your labor and just invite you onto the roller coaster with him. Some place of joy, some place of intimacy. He said it's been too long. So maybe we'd be people like a young Mr. Morales who are kingdom bringers, finding new and creative ways to let people experience the goodness of God because the world needs great stories. And finally, Christ on the inside, let him rule. Let him rule. We're gonna unpack these words here. Christ on the inside. To them, this is Colossians 1, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the one we proclaim, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. This unpacking here of this mystery which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the favorite verse of my predecessor and my pastor for many, many, many years, Richard Dahlstrom. The mystery which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. First, it's a mystery. Faith is not a formula. Be wary of those that try to prescribe it as such. Paul says, lean into the mystery. Second, Christ has been revealed to us. We don't have to live in doubt. May we seek the revelation that is Jesus Christ. And the third, the Christ in you is the hope of glory. What a magical phrase. Hope that can never be taken away. Not just for an easy journey. The hope of glory. What is the hope of glory? It's a mystery, but it's also all fullness of the Holy Spirit within us. And that one day we'll see God face to face and this life of difficulty and toil will be over. And then we'll reach reach the far shore where our journey will find its ultimate destination. But while we live, that even now we would live in love, that we would live by Christ, that we will experience the river of living water that never runs out. That now in our lives, in small moments, which become for us a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven, we can have Christ within us. And so for us as a church, that we would be people, not just working all the time for the inbreaking of the kingdom, but people resting in the knowledge of the hope of glory is a gift, not about our effort, but about trusting him. Where we're working a little bit less for our salvation and we're resting because of his love for us. And the good news for any of you who believe in Jesus, that Christ lives in you. He lives in you. He lives in you. He lives in you. So how do we, like, let's unpack this, uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts from 315. Like, this really seems like the nugget. Like, how do we live like this? How do we let peace rule in our hearts? I mean, consider for a moment, what, what rules you? Anything rules you that, you that you serve, that you think about daily, that you're under the sway of? So what rules you? Uh, the, the word here in Greek is brabuu, which means to rule or to umpire. It's an umpire word, which a lot of us are watching the Mariners right now. Uh, umpire. He says, uh, let the peace of Christ umpire in your heart. Let him arbitrate a conflict. Let him deal with contending forces within you. So to let Christ rule in, him, rule in us means allowing more of Christ to overpower that which is not Christ's peace, not Christ's love. And that's just for very practical purposes. This is where prayer is so important for us, that we learn to meditate on the presence of God within, that we learn to spend time soaking in that identity truth that we are formed for Christ's presence, that we would consider those forces that want to rule over us and instead let Christ rule within. So final words to live by. May we be people who rest well. May we rest well. Scott, you just told us a story about a young man who's got enough cash to take five workers to Disneyland. And like, it seems kind of conflicting. We're working, we're putting on goodness and we're resting in his peace. How do we do both? They're not my words, they're the Bible. (laughs) He's just like, hey, church in Colossae, this is what it looks like. Like, you'll actually inspire the generation ahead of you to trust more of God when you rest, not on your efforts, but on his power. So may we be a people inspired by the goodness of God and resting into it, resting literally by, hey, we know how to take an off day. We know how to 
rest well by the power of God, when we run up into significant troubles in our life, we're people of prayer first, resting in God's power, not just our own. May we be people that are resting in his power. May we be people learning how to really trust what the Spirit of God has given us. Living in our identity, uh, working for the kingdom, being people wrapping ourselves in goodness, people resting with God's power within. Uh, Resting in uh, his power reminds me back to where we started where um, at the end of his life, Henry David Thoreau had gotten sick. He mo- took multiple trips into Concord where his friends were and his doctors. And when he, when he died, what was left there was just his cabin, which is no longer there. There's a recreatment. And uh, his friends wanted to remember him. And now if you go to Walden, you'll see a sign with one of his quotes. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. Simple words, but his words would so inspire his friends that his friends wanted to commemorate his life. They didn't want to just bring flowers or something temporary. So they started with the Alcott sisters, most scholars believe. They grabbed stones from their gardens and they walked out to the place by Walden and they dropped a stone as a marker that his words had impacted their lives. And in that image there, every one of those stones and those guesses, those are stones from around the world. They'll say, hey, that man's words weren't just words on a page. They helped me live different. I don't actually care much about American literature, most of us. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about a stone that you would drop as a pile to say thank you to somebody who has come before you or influenced your life, maybe pass that on to them. Maybe text someone today, hey, I was thinking about you in church. Thanks for being an influence in my life. And may we as a church continue to be people just dreaming of impacting this world in such a way, believing that we're leaving a pile of stones behind us. And when we start running out of our own effort and our energy, remember the only thing that matters is the life of Jesus within. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word of life. So if we want words to live by, our lives are going to have to be connected to Jesus' life within us. And yes, there will be darkness. There will be opposition. There will be hard days but the word of life can hold us strong. Near the end of his ministry, when conflict arose and people were bailing on him left, right, and center, Jesus turns to his disciples and he said, will you leave too? Peter said, where else will we go? Jesus, you have, do you remember what he says? You have the words of life. You have the words of life. The word, words to live by, is the word of Jesus, his spirit within. So may we be reflecting our identity. May we put on lives that look more and more like Christ. And may we rest in the knowledge that Christ is in us the hope of glory. It's not about our effort. It's releasing ourselves and control into his good word for our lives. Let's pray now. God, thank you so much for times to stop and pause and consider all that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the children, the young ones, the graduates, those that are heading into a new grade or a new season, maybe a new town. God, as they go, may they go with your words over them and in them. May you continue to inspire them. And God, for every one of us in the room, as we stop and pause and consider you are the word of life, Jesus. Give us lives connected to your goodness. Give us a deep encouragement that your words are the words to live by. And we forget, call us back to remembering, Jesus, you are the word of life. So may your word come alive in us. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, it's communion Sunday, and hopefully you're able to grab communion when you came in. If you didn't grab one, they're on the uh, edges where our bulletins were. And we're gonna take communion now as a team. I'm gonna ask our prayer ministers to come forward too. Um, On the night in which he's betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. So when you take and eat, you'll do this in remembrance of me and we take the body of Christ even now. 
And then in the same way as we flip over this little plastic cup, Jesus, he lifted his cup with all of his best friends, and they didn't even understand what was happening, but he did, and said, this is, this is my blood. This is a new covenant I pour out for you. And so as you drink my blood, as you eat my body, do this uh, both in remembrance of me, but in a knowledge of forgiveness of all things. So let's drink together. Jesus, thank you for communion. Thank you for your body and blood. Thank you for this bread and juice as a small tangible reminder that you are the words of life. In your death and your resurrection and your ascension, you left us yourself. You left your spirit that lives within us. God, help this hope of glory rise in us. Help us clothe ourselves with you. Help us rest in our new identity as people full of you. May we never forget. God, we love you and we trust you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. As we rise to our feet and we sing, we worship. This morning, as... uh, we were praying for the service. I was mindful that for some of us, when we think about words to live by, the challenge is we have other words that are playing in a loop in our head. Somebody who spoke of discouragement over us, words of shame or condemnation, words of hate, words that were not enough, that will never be enough, words that our life is turning out differently than we anticipated, words that were unlovable. It's never how Jesus speaks to you. It's never how the word of life is revealed in you. So as we sing and worship, maybe for some of you, you would like to get some prayer this morning. You're carrying an old word that just needs to be left like a, like a stone in a pond and sunk to the bottom where it can be for, forgotten and receive a new word of love to be written over your life. For others of you, you just want to be encouraged as we sing I'm reminded together that the word of life, Jesus, the spirit within, is is the word to live by. Amen? Amen. So let us stand, let us pause, and then let us sing out to the Lord. Our prayer ministers would love to pray with you. Let us sing and worship the Lord together.